Welcome back ladies and gentlemen, I'm the Serious Strategy Game and we are returning to Rule the Ways 3. I have played a couple of turns off camera simply because nothing much was happening and we're now in October 1943, so three years after you guys left me, uh, so quite a bit of a time. And in the meantime some interesting things have happened, so let's go through the changes here and why this is the moment where you guys join me. There are international developments, there are new technologies, and there are new ships. Let's go into the international developments first. Look at this down here. So, we have just got an event that um, something was going on in Greece. There was turmoil there. We had the chance to send an expeditionary force and uh, become part of the civil war. We did that, we gambled, and this time around we won? Question mark. So we now control Greece. That is, of course, vast, really, really uh, historical. Uh, but I think it works because technically a Boma is in the Indian Ocean, so that is next to that. And it's kind of interesting. And of course, Japan has never done that in um, historically, although I think they had plans to go for as far as uh, Madagascar at some point. But, you know, I, I st it's not without out of the realm of possibilities. Uh, certainly the Europeans did stuff in Asia, so why not the other way around? Now, the reason I said yes to that is A, because it's fun, and B, because it is actually super useful, because that puts pretty much all of you within invasion range of us, and we now have a foothold here in the region where at least Italy has its home port, and I do believe even Spain has their home port, right? Yeah, this is the home area? No, I think it is the, yeah, it is the home area. So, uh, Fran France also has a lot of stuff here, so... It is an interesting region, and that is specifically true because if we look at the relations, we can see that nationalist China has good relations, or an alliance actually, with France and Italy. Notice that Germany and uh, the UK are also still aligned. So I think this is a, is a, is a perfect way to project force against Italy specifically, and potentially go up against China and, and have the ability to hurt the Europeans all around. And it just puts on, us on a much more level playing field with them being able to send ships our way and we can now send ships their way. So all in all pretty big development and I think a good start here for our uh, little empire. That's not all there is to this. This is in rebellion, so I think we'll need to send ships here, we'll need to control for that, and it obviously increased um, the tensions with a lot of the other nations, with France, with nationalist China, and with the UK. We'll need to balance that a little bit, because if we go to war with the UK and France, we're also going to be at war with nationalist China and Italy, and if we're at war with the UK, we're also going to be at war with Germany. And as far as we have progressed, I don't think it's going to be viable to be at war with pretty much all of the world at the same time. So yeah, uh, we'll, need to, we'll need to be a little bit careful, but not too much. So I think one of the things that I would like to do here is build a fortification and build actually a small coastal battery. Just the smallest one, it doesn't cost us that much in maintenance, nor in build cost. Um, but I think that might help actually with the revolution here. I'm not sure it does, but let's try anyway. So that's the one thing that we're going to do is uh, we'll also need to look at the aircraft situation there. No, sorry, that's the aircraft types. We are developing a couple of things. I'm proud to have a decent fighter at this point. And um, this is actually going pretty fast at least for propeller planes. And it has decent range, decent firepower, decent okay toughness, but good maneuverability. So yeah, decent fighters is what we've got. By the way, how's your reliability? It's average. Average is okay. Yeah, the naval patrol craft, these guys are poor reliability, that's why we are getting new ones. But before we get sidetracked, um, let's look at the air groups here and build at least a couple here in Athena. And I want to add an air unit. I think we're going to add a fighter group here, which is going to be 10 planes. Mm, let's do 8 planes. I, I rarely see the AI really deal with this stuff. Then we're going to add a couple of uh, medium bombers. And I think in Petra... Um, we're going to do something very similar. We are going to, you know what, we're actually going to expand the airbase in Athens too. And in Petrina, we are going to add an air unit. That's going to be another fighter group of, let's say, six aircraft. And we are also going to add 14, yeah, that makes sense, naval patrol craft. 
simply so that we've got a little bit more vision there. And in Heraklion, or actually Thessaloniki, let's pick Thessaloniki. On the other hand, Heraklion, that's on Crete, and that is, I think, a little bit closer towards potential engagements area in the middle of the ocean. So Heraklion would be a good one for that. Yeah, so let's pick Heraklion at an air unit, and that is going to be some dive bombers, which I think is going to be a nice choice. And there we go. That gives us a bit of power here. We'll also send forces down there, but before we go into that, let's talk about new technologies. And unfortunately, there's nothing that I can show you except for clicking on things. Uh, but you can already see one of the first big things down here. That is jet aircraft on carriers. We can now build carriers that are jet carrier capable. Now, that's not that useful, as, as you might imagine for now, because uh, let's look at what the AI would do here. Uh, jet AI, uh, jet capable that is costing us a lot of weight. This is a ship of 36,000 tons. If we make it jet capable, that is costing us almost 7,000 tons. So 72 jets or, or well over 100, 100 uh, 116 normal aircraft, propeller aircraft. So it's a huge investment to do that, uh, but at least it is possible and it is giving us the glimpse of the future uh, at which point we might also need to think about um, these types of aircraft. Speaking about the future, no, uh, we also have a new research uh, research area, and that is missile technology. So we now know that this exists. We haven't um, found out anything, but we are giving that high priority. We are investing a lot there um, and hopefully getting some new technologies in the not too distant future. Of course, October 1943, some of that is going to be um, sort of very basic, but it's still interesting to see that that is happening. There are also a couple of smaller technologies that we have found. I'm going to go look, click at that uh, here on the design screen. We found the ASW mortars or rockets, so something like the Hedgehog system, uh, which does allow us to just be better at anti-submarine warfare. That's nice to see. We've also gotten um, on the six inch guns. We now have the possibility to use autoloaders, so they are going to be uh, able to fire a lot quicker, but they're also weighing more. So that's an interesting uh, new possibility. We also have better raid installations. We are now at le level two, but that's not that critical. And also we do have an advantage here in diesel. And I think that might actually be for the first time kind of relevant. I know because yeah, we don't have any speed set. Let's look at normal. Let's look at a, at, at a decent speed here. Um, so what does difference does that make? Yeah, diesel does now give us a little bit of weight, even at short ranges. And, and I think this would be much better even at uh, longer ranges. Yeah, so small advantage now for diesel uh, craft. That is something that we'd want to consider in the future, but it's not dramatically different. And then lastly, let's talk about our new ships. So ships and servers. Uh, let's solve by displacement. Uh, we have gotten, of course, the Hiruju into service. She's now one of our biggest carriers at 40,000 tons. Um, and she's going to be paired, or she is already paired with Akagi. These are going to be our prime, prime fleet carriers for the foreseeable future at 124 aircraft and 90 aircraft. So these are very, very good aircraft. We've also finished the reconstruction of the Hosho classes. Uh, no, sorry, of the, yeah, of the uh, Katori classes. They are decent size. They carry 70 aircraft each, but they are so, so, so slow. And they do have uh, some issues with torpedo protection. They have very good belt armor because they are converted battleships. Mm, but honestly, I'm, I'm, they are very much second line. Uh, speaking of second line, also the Hosha classes. These are a little bit faster, 27 knots, but they only carry less than 50 aircraft each. So yeah, that's not great. Um, notice, by the way, that I did put a little bit more fighters than normal on these two guys, simply because I think they're going to be extremely vulnerable to air attack and specifically torpedo bomber attack. That is that is going to be a big issue for these guys, uh, since that 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 could potentially be devastating for them. With the low speed, with the low torpedo protection scheme on the armor, they they are really vulnerable to that. Uh, let's shoot down anyone before they come to us. And this is, I think in 1943, this is a fair assessment to have two-thirds fighters and, and one-third strike aircraft. 
I'll just switch out a couple of our torpedo bombers to dive bombers because as AA is getting better, and that's certainly the case in 1943, uh, dive bombers are I think going to be the better choice than torpedo bombers. At least torpedo bombers doing actual torpedo runs. We can now also do level bombing with torpedo bombers. Right, that being said, there are exciting new ships that I want to tell you about. So the first and biggest news is this, guys. The Soju Sur 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 class. I'm going to butcher that. Um, that is a 44,000 ton ship. That's bigger probably than our biggest battleship. Now, nah, well, it's it's similar. Other than that, honestly, it's, it's very close to this design. Very much the same speed. Um, and pretty much an upscale version of that. Now capable of carrying 133 aircraft. And I think with slightly more deck armor, flight deck armor and such. Uh, but not really that drastically different, I would say. Right, and then there is this guy down here. That is the Yoshino class. That is a new class that we have designed. And this is very close. You know what? I'm actually going to show you that in the design screen here. And these guys are very much inspired by the historical Atlanta class. These are anti-air light cruisers. So they are very much purposely built to provide anti-air cover for some of our capital ships and maybe potentially even specifically the carriers um, that that do that are pretty vulnerable to that so in order to do that we just added quite a bunch of guns on these guys they've got one two three four five six seven eight five inch guns so that is that is fairly significant and all of these are dual purpose so they can fire against enemy aircraft and that is giving us this heavy aa factor of 47. The own AA guns of these guys, they're pretty low, honestly, uh, but that is just a consequence of the top side load that we have before this ship is going to tip over. And its main task is actually be going to be to sail next to a carrier and, and provide um, them with lots and lots of heavy AA fire. Hopefully that is going to work and add a lot to that. 47 is quite a high number. I, th I think these are by far the best AA ships that we have. Um, other than that, they are pretty weak in some aspects and that is specifically the armor scheme it's very lightly armored and its main guns are not that great against uh, bigger threats so it, it's really purpose built for what it needs to do we don't expect it to be anywhere near where firing is happening but if it do, if it would happen to be in a, such a situation it wouldn't be great and that is a little bit i think the historical um the historical experience of the Atlanta itself, I think. Wasn't the Atlanta sunk in the Battle of the Guadalcanal um, Strait? I think it was. Um, and it's it's due to the awesome firepower that these guys have, but being so, so vulnerable, and that is a bit of a design flaw if you put them in, in the wrong place. But we hope that this specialized design can be pretty good. They also carry a couple of torpedoes, and that's a deviation from the purpose-built stuff that I usually like to do. Uh, the main reason for that is that I want these guys to have some ASW capability in the future and in the future they can get a little bit more capabilities if they do have torpedoes um, and, and that would be a nice uh, dual capability. They can also um, just in an emergency send off a couple of torpedoes against a heavy cruiser or something, uh, turn them away by a little bit of time and it's not that much weight it is a bit of topside weight it also saves us uh, they have a bit of reserve here for future upgrades to the radar notice that these guys have a radar limit of three because they are capable of carrying up to that limit even though our technical limit is currently up to two so sort of we uh, built these guys future ready if you want there, there is some space there on the top side uh, to be able to fit future radar sets uh, without going back into dock basically Right, so very excited about these ships and they're going to come into service in a couple of months. Uh, we do want to build a, li a little bit more of these guys, but we don't really have the funds right now, especially as we are expanding uh, quite a couple of other things. Uh, also, we have sent or we are sending our uh, submarines all over the place. So the other thing that we probably should do is with tensions being that high, notice that pretty much all of our guys are currently in reserve service, except for the first carrier group. These guys are on active service. And this guy for some reason. I must have uh, forgotten to switch him off basically. You can see the difference here in costs. That is that is basically a factor of two. So that being said, I think it makes sense to put at least the all of the carriers and the Yashima, so our best ships, 
into active service and let's actually take the entire first battle squadron and uh, we're going to put you into active service that means these guys are going to train up and gain some experience you can already see the impact there on our budget uh, which is pretty pretty bad right so on well, and you guys you can also be active that is all going to cost us a lot of money and we probably need to uh, pause the construction of some of these carriers in, in the not too distant future uh, I also want to go to Doctrine and go back to training on torpedo warfare. I don't think gunnery is good. I think damage control might be might be a good choice. That is going to be a 40% increase in maintenance costs. Notice that that is slightly lower for Japan because Japan is considered uh, to have a bit of a, a better training regime. Now, all of these things do cost us a lot of money. So let's go to the next turn and see how our budget is going to evolve and how these threat levels are going to be um, affected by that. Ooh, France and China has expired. That is that is kind of good, kind of bad, uh, because we would very much like to uh, enter war with China. Now, our financial situation has completely collapsed. Let's halt the construction of our carriers, even though I would love to see them. And I would specifically love to see them before the outbreak of a war, but I don't think that is something that we can afford right now. We could dial down the research a little bit. That might be helpful, I think. Yeah, let's do it. Just a little bit. It's a third of our budget, actually. Right, so. Oh, and we do need to send some, some people to, um, to the Met, basically. So shall we take at least you guys? Your active service, you could be active service. So two heavy cruisers, is that going to be enough? We could send the second battle group. Or we could send the first battle group. Hmm, tough call. Okay, so what I'm going to do is take six of you guys. One, two, three, four, five, six. You're going to be active fleet. That is going to cost us again some money. But you're going to be moved towards the Mediterranean. We're also going to move the heavy cruisers there. You and you. So that we have at least some level of support there. And it's going to take at least three turns, I think, for you to get there. Southeast Asia, Indian Ocean, Mediterranean. Yeah, that makes sense. Light cruisers, any that we want to send there? I think the Suma class is pretty good at AA, actually, isn't it? No, well, eight, eight five inch guns, that can't be very good. No, that's the radar, sorry. This guy is pretty good at AA. 12 dual purpose guns, yeah, I think you are also going to be activated and sent towards the Mediterranean. We don't have enormous basing capabilities there anyway, so we shouldn't send everyone at the same time. Right, one other thing that I wanted to do is open these guys here for rebuilds and add the Hedgehog to you. That rebuild would be extremely inexpensive, so let's do it. Yeah, I'm gonna be fine with that. Sorry about the noise here. And we don't wanna rebuild that right now. We wanna take basically all of our Corvettes and rebuild them at the same time. 1943 variant, there we go. Batty anti-submarine warfare capabilities. That is, I think, very much going to be appreciated. And it's only three months, so that's nice. Um, I think we also had a couple of other guys that we wanted to specifically use for anti-submarine warfare duties. Wasn't there? Was it the Mi Mikanzi class? Minikazi class? Let's open that for a rebuild and see. Poor gunnery. Only single torpedo? Yeah, these, these are the guys. On the other hand, you're already struggling there with the weight that you've got. Well, if we reduce the mines, that might help. Let's delete one more turret, and you'd be you'd be okay with weight. Yeah. So since you are already supposed to do anti-submarine warfare stuff, that's going to be all right. Short range oil fuel, yeah, yeah, that's that's all okay, and. We're going to refurbish all of you guys here. 
to just do this. It's not going to be very expensive, so we might as well get ready for the next war here. Right. Oh, commanders. Uh, apparently someone retired, so you're going to get a new commander. And the way I like to do that is I typically, for the smaller ships, like to pick someone who's unassigned currently. Um, or who's assigned to a light carrier or something like that. A light cruiser. Well, there's no one. So let's pick the average guy here. Average is not bad. Right. How are the tensions going to develop? That That is the big question here. Akaji Hashidati. These are the light carriers. That's good to see. Ooh. Didi Kizaragi. Not entirely sure what type of ship you were. But we do think it might have been the Chinese. Now, if our budget is going to increase and we are increasing tensions with China, that's going to be good. Oh, and this is also brilliant. Electro-optical directors. That means we can get new directors and... And... Upgrade our ships. War declared. War between Japan and China. Ah, good and not good. Let's see. Let's see how that is. That is going to turn out. And uh, now, firstly, let's look at the uh, Let's look at the almanac here and see whether the Chinese monster has been built. And uh, the answer is, I think you are around, and that is a big issue. So we know that this guy has been built last year with his 11 17-inch guns, his 14 and a half inches of belt armor, and I don't know. I think we saw at some point seven inches of deck armor. So he's going to be extremely difficult to get 25 inch dual purpose guns. Now, the silver lining here is that they don't have a lot of other things. They have, they don't even have the Ever Cruiser, that's just being built. They have one AV, which can support a couple of aircraft, 12 aircraft, but they not going to bomb us. Uh, and they have a couple of pretty old, not even 1930s destroyers. Now they do carry torpedoes and they are dangerous, but that being said, I don't think that these guys are going to be super, super dangerous for us. Uh, what we definitely do need to do though is get all of our stuff into reserve, uh, into active status, um, including all of our air bases, please. That is costing us enormous amounts of money. And currently all of our ships are pretty poorly trained. Um, so the hope is going to be that we're going to be able to get this done quickly um, and before anyone else enters the war. Now remember, China is allied to Italy at least, so it might very well be that Italy is going to enter the war, but at least for now they are not. What would happen at that point? If Italy enters the war, they've got four battleships, but only half of our tonnage, so they can't be pretty big. Well, let's look at them in detail actually. So yeah, 1920s battleships, the Roma and the Viterio Veneto, 14 inches, 7 inches of belt armor, that's that's pretty bad. Also speed 18. These guys are, are really, really obsolete. They're going to be sitting ducks. I don't particularly like the fact that they have quite a couple of carriers, but honestly the speed, the number of aircraft, that's not too terrible I would say. Giant bunch of destroyers though, that could be a little bit more dangerous, especially with all of their mining equipment. We might need to think about some minesweeper here. We could build a corvette of 500 tons, that would be done in four months and we could do minesweeping. We need to see how far they get though. Um, and what did they have in terms of heavy cruisers? That seemed a little bit more numerous at least. Some of them have good speed, 9 inch guns, 5 inches of belt armor, interesting setup. So they are a little bit more um, on, the, on, the, on the slightly lighter ship side. And I think they do have a pronounced advantage in that category. Oh yeah, like a factor of 3, almost 4. Uh, well, let's call it 3. Uh, light cruisers, similar. Destroyers, they have an advantage. Submarines, that's also something that we should check. Well, they do have some. And not that few naval aircraft. It looks like we have more, but still, they are going to be dangerous. And there's the danger also that tensions with Great Britain and or France would escalate. 
But that being said, at least we have uh, beaten back the rebellion in Greece. So that's good. And we are building a couple of things here. Active, active, active. Yeah, we are building, improving naval bases. We are building that battery. Uh, I don't think we have a motor torpedo boat squadron in Greece. That is something that I would like to see here. Because these guys are going to turn into missile boats. They're not going to be that expensive in the long term. So, and the Mediterranean might well be a, a place where we are going to fight in the future. Right, so that being said, um, I think I'm going to call this episode the Eve of War. <laughs> and it's actually the war that has started. Um, if we look at the disposition of enemy forces, we know the Chinese are pretty much surprise, surprise in our home waters. Uh, with their battleship, their AFV, some other ships, I very much expect that we are going to see a battle here involving the beast, the the giant, the enormous ship, the seeming the monster of China, sixty thousand tons. I don't think this is this is by far the biggest ship in game that we have. I think this is not quite the battle uh, the the size of the uh, Yamato which I think was around 72,000 tons, but I'm not too sure. I'll need to double check. And I think she had 18 inches of, of armor, but within uh, the scope of the game, this, this guy is absolutely, absolutely gonna be horrific. We're gonna see how this turns out. For now, thank you very much for watching, guys. Hope you enjoyed. Do leave a like, and I'll see you around next time. Bye-bye.